And I went on to win the seat in North. I said, well, I couldn't ask for more. Because from I met him, I found him such a charming person that I knew that we would strike up an excellent relationship. What started off as a political relationship developed into a deep and abiding friendship. A talented, caring, and patient man of extraordinary honesty and integrity. We can hardly think of an area of life experience that he and I did not discuss, analyze, and over the six years that we served together, there was hardly a week that he didn't have something new to offer me. Ken was always a deep, philosophical thinker, steeped in high principles and simple, ordinary decency. At a quiet moment, visit to the home of the founder of Project Hope in Maryland, we hotels reserved because we hadn't intended to stay overnight. And Dr. Walsh said, well, there is a guest room, but you'll have to share it. I was the first to say, sure. And we stayed together in Dr. Walsh's guest room. And during the night, of course, we spent most of the time talking because Ken was always at work. I think the only time he perhaps got some rest was when he was asleep. But whilst he was awake, he was always thinking about what next could be done to enhance the health services of Jamaica. And indeed, we went to Maryland to seek financing from the HOPE project. I think, quite frankly, that Ken Ball would have made a brilliant teacher. I think that was his true talent, being able to convey information clearly precisely, easily understood. And quite frankly, he would reduce every conversation about health to explaining it and drawing it. So if you had a pain in your knee, he would draw the knee. Anything that he had to explain, he would commit it to drawings and explaining it in such detail. This was a man that had no sense of lack of confidence or anything of the kind. He was a most confident person. And he faced all the challenges. And there were many political challenges that he faced. But speaking of challenges, I hope you will pardon me, but there was a time when we, in fact, when we went into the ministry, he was 39, I was 38. So at that age, you're bushy-tailed bushy and bright-eyed. And I, of course, I wasn't short of ambition. So I decided that after a while, I'd try my hand at being the general secretary of the party. And as is the custom, you go to the leader and you advise him that this is your intention and this is what you would like to do. So I went to Mr. Siaga and I said, Mr. Siaga, you know, having served the party for so many years, I think I would like to try my hand at being the general secretary. I felt absolutely confident that he was going to say, okay, fine. Mr. Siaga turned to me and he said, well, that's a good idea, but I have in mind another man. And I said, who might that be, Mr. Siaga? He said, Dr. Ken Ball. Well, I went back to Ken and I said, no, Ken, what are we going to do here now? 
two best friends going to quarrel about a position. Ken says, well, to tell you the truth, I have been thinking of it seriously, and I think I can do a good job. I say, well, it's the same feeling I have, so. <laughs> he says, no, man, let's contest. And we did. Never once was there even a scintilla to suggestion that there was any deficiency of either one. We went in, and the remarkable thing about it is Ken took everything in his stride. So when I turned up on the, Monday, on the Sunday evening at the election, everybody I saw in the yard, everybody I saw said, you're cool, you're all right, don't worry about it. I said, boy, this looks very good. <laughs> and then I started feeling sorry for my friend Ken. <laughs> but there was a peculiar thing that happened. There was a door, and if anybody knowing the Belmont Road meeting room, there's a door that leads to the back. And I noticed that that door kept opening and closing after Mr. Siaga had retired to his office. And I noticed that when they were going through the door, they were like this. <laughs> and when they came back into the room, they were like this. <laughs> I said, Carl, this doesn't look good. <laughs> and all those who promised to vote for me, when the vote came in, Ken gave me the most spectacular thrashing of my life. <laughs> he beat me three to one. And we had a good laugh about it and went on to work for the party. Those were the good old days. For Ken, being in politics and winning was not as important as his consideration for the opportunity that politics offered to serve in the building of a nation. That was his primary motivation. And that motivation saw him go right up the ladder. General Secretary, I, re I subsequently became General Secretary when he had moved on, thankfully. General, he became the chairman of the party up to 2007 when the winner of that election, newly elected leader and prime minister designate, called Ken and I into his office. Ken being the general sec Ken being the chairman, I being the general secretary, and he said, I'd like to have a word with you. I figured he was going to say, now, well, unfortunately, you know, although you have worked so hard, I don't have any room for you in my cabinet. But that wasn't the case. He said, I want you to share with me my thoughts. And he went through the list of cabinet ministers, and I was confirmed as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I think former Prime Minister, my apologies for, and my friend, former Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller. But former Prime Minister Patterson, you will recall, we discussed foreign affairs at one time. Ken was asked to take up the Ministry of Health. Well, I wasn't too fond of foreign affairs, I must tell you. So he and I arranged to go to church in Portmore. When we left church, we went to a restaurant to have a little breakfast, brunch, really. And I said to him, Ken, you know, I have been thinking. Because I like organization, and I like to be involved on the ground floor and so on, and because my temperament is not quite as amenable to people who you just meet for the first time as yours is. <laughs> I said, I have been thinking, Ken, that maybe we should um, switch posts, switch jobs. And I would give you foreign affairs, and I didn't want health. Having served there for six years with him, that was enough for me. 
but I will go to the Prime Minister and ask him for a new assignment, which I did, but Ken was livid. Said, hey, you know, you let me down, look how close we are, and I'm getting prepared, I have all my plans for health and so on. I said, you never mind, leave it to me. Then I heard that he got a call from the Prime Minister. I waited outside, and we were in there for the longest time. He walked through the door, and he looked at me. Say, you see you? Our friendship is over. <laughs> you? I said, don't worry, boy, Ken. You're going to do fantastically well. I know you are. When I went in to see the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister said, I gave him the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but I also made him Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> I called Ken immediately and said, Ken, this wasn't in the deal at all. <laughs> and look what a wonderful deputy prime minister we had in Ken. You know, his compelling urge led him to the far reaches of West Central St. Catherine, where he and his loving and life partner, Vilma, spent endless days and nights tending to the needs of the sick and the lame and the dispossessed. Many times I would scold him for having her out that late, but they would be trotting through the mountains and she would more often than not be driving him. Ken indeed was essentially a rural representative. He was a countryman at heart. He loved being among the farmers and rural folks generally. I knew how much he grieved for them as he often shared with me his concern for their future. He was a very diligent and careful person, however. I can remember, and I hope I'm not going too long, but Vilma, be careful when you ask me to give anything because the Prime Minister knows that he must guard me carefully in Parliament. But I can recall his sense of diligence when we had an accident in Lionel Town, in Maypen, and some of the patients had to be rushed to Lionel Town Hospital. And there was a particular patient that without taking off the leg, their life, his life would be at risk. Ken and Mavis, Dr. Mavis Gilmore, who was a surgeon there to do it. And Ken rolled up his sleeves after carefully considering it, amputated the leg, and the man went on to have a healthy life. That was the kind of person Ken Ball was. Didn't matter whether he was considered it was outside of his normal protocol. If there was someone in need, he would go out of his way to end pain and suffering. Always willing to share his knowledge through a on tours as painful as it was sometimes, walking with Ken Ball through a medical ward is an experience that unless you take that trip. He stopped at every bed, get the story on every patient, express his concern for every patient. Wonderful, wonderful man. For him, the game of politics was never something that he would get depressed about if he wasn't successful, as long as it was played honestly. And as respected that when he acted as leader of the opposition for the brief while that the Prime Minister was getting his footing in another part of the city. The then Governor General was the person he defeated in 1980, Sir Howard Cook. And Sir Howard Cook invited him and a team of us to King's House. And although, as the Governor General here will 
a test. There is no ceremony for the introduction of a leader of the opposition. But he created a Because, as he said then, his respect for Ken Ball was so great that he could not miss the opportunity. And this was a man who Ken Ball politically defeated in 1980. As I say, these were the good old days. Ken Ball is responsible because of his caring and diligence and swiftness of action at a Saved my son's life, who had been struck with um, a crippling ailment that would have destroyed his life. Ken Ball was the one who came to our rescue. You know, I could go on for a long time, but I will now simply say, we can only thank God for giving us Ken Ball for as long as he did. We can be comforted in the knowledge that he spent a wonderful and fulfilling life, covered in the love and loyalty of an incredibly loyal life partner, Vilma, who we refer to constantly as Vil. And their three beautiful children, Warren, Melanie, and Gregory. He enjoyed including his brothers Barry, Howard, and Donnie. Those are the ones that I met personally. His sister, Juliet Paulette, and dear Lorna, who gave so much to the very end, to the man who she loved so dearly. So, if you may permit me to just paraphrase a sonnet that is one of my favorite pieces from Shakespeare that says, is Sonnet 116. Let me not to the marriage of true alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. Your Excellency Sir Patrick Allen, Mr. Prime Minister, Leader of the Opposition, members of the government, members of the clergy, family and friends. It's good afternoon for us, but a beautiful sunset for our dear daddy, Kenneth Lee O'Neill Ball. Daddy was the standard by which we measured everyone in our lives. He was the voice of reason, the quiet calm in chaos, the lighthouse in the storms of our lives. If he were here now, he would tell me to stop talking nonsense. He'd say, you know, I'm not comfortable with you referring to me as a lighthouse because God should be the only lighthouse in your life. But that was the thing with Daddy. God's light shone from him. In everything he did, in every life he touched, God's light radiated from him. He gave of himself so unselfishly I remember the story of when I was a baby and walked barefoot into the cinders of a dying fire. Daddy was a medical student at the time, about to go sit an important exam, but he didn't go that day. He stayed with me all day as I sat with my burnt feet in a basin of water. Of course, I was too young to remember the incident, but I know something. There were many times after that that my brothers and I walked into hot fires. And every time we needed daddy, he dropped everything to be there for us. The funny thing is, in reading the tributes about him these past days, we realized that our father would do that for anyone. 
He was a great man. He wouldn't want to hear me say that either. In his eyes, greatness was not measured by a man's achievements, by his physical stature, or the girth of his bank account, but by how low he would bow before God. Our father was a great man. He was our protector. He always wanted to ensure that we were safe. He hated when we drove late at night, always warning us to lock our doors and wear our seat belts. He'd walk around the house at bedtime, ensuring all doors were locked and we were safe in our beds. With this penchant for locking up came just a slight obsession with keys. When we were children, he started to keep his keys on his waistband. Um, but as the years passed, the bunch got bigger and bigger. My brothers and I would always know when daddy was coming because you'd hear the jingle jangle long before you saw him. And you could never leave your keys lying around carelessly, for by some miraculous force, they'd be sucked onto daddy's bunch. I remember a few times we had guests searching for their keys after a function we'd had, and mommy would casually say, has somebody checked daddy's bunch? And sure enough, there they were. But it was just a desire to make sure that everyone was secure. He wanted to know everybody was happy. There was no greater pleasure for him than on a Sunday when he went into the kitchen to cook. And I'm not just talking about regular cooking. Daddy was a reader. He was a researcher. So the planning of the meal actually started the week before. He'd read the recipes. Then he'd read about the country they came from, the history of the spices, and the methods of cooking. And when daddy cooked, he didn't just capture a flavor, he captured the essence of a culture. For Sunday dinners, we would sometimes have up to six different dishes cooked in six different styles, and he would make sure there was enough for everyone. Our home was always filled with family and friends coming by to travel the world through daddy's culinary skills. When my brothers and I started having our own children, daddy ensured that his home remained the gathering spot for our growing families. He became our colic whisperer, walking our babies up and down that passage, singing, singing his greatest hits of wooden heart and can I have this dance, doing his little bow-legged jig, so much were these songs ingrained into our children's minds that Layla, one of his granddaughters, could belt out the entire lyrics of Could I Have This Dance before she could even form a proper sentence in speech. In the later years, Daddy got too busy to cook, but he gained pleasure from traveling through his constituency, learning about the people, researching the ways to bring productivity to their communities. He knew them by name. He knew their needs. He ran back to school clinics. He tended the elderly, never turning a patient away, whether they could pay or not. He resisted the habit of the world to commend only when great heights had been achieved. And instead, he focused on the kernel of promise in everyone he met. He knew that to achieve, one had to be given a chance. And that he did. He took those kernels, he watered them, he nurtured them, and he guided them with his unbending morals and faith. When we were younger, our home was beside a family not as well off as we were. Of course, I'd see my father helping them many times. One day, he brought home a live chicken as payment he'd received from a patient. A live chicken. These two went crazy. They wanted that chicken. I think I overheard them planning to build a rocket to see how fast they could get it to the moon. But I, I knew what daddy would have wanted to do with that chicken. I knew what he would have wanted me to say. So at the top of my voice, I said, let us give that chicken to the people next door. They have so little and we have so much. I couldn't understand my father's anger. I was so confused. Later on, he came to me and he said, Melanie, I want you to know something. When you give, never, ever be pompous and loud. And when you give, never do it at the detriment of that person's pride. 
and that was my father. Quiet service. Half of the strides he made in his career were not we were not aware of until we read of them. His humility in public was the same humility he displayed in private. He never cared if he didn't fit in. He never sought fanfare. He only sought the road that was honest and right. As somebody aptly said, Ken Ball was a statesman who served people through politics. The people of Jamaica were his love. This country was his love. And he went about his service with his precious Vilma always by his side. My parents did everything together. They were best friends. These grounds we walk on today, my parents walked on as students, both Irvin Hall residents, Vilma and Ken from then. And in this very chapel, they took their vows and became man and wife. My mother told me that daddy was the warm blanket around her shoulders, no matter how cold and harsh the world got. And mommy, you have been daddy's blanket. You took such good care of him. You never left his side in sickness or in health. When he got ill, never once did you balk at the task ahead of you. You remained his beautiful bride till the very end. The nurses would always laugh and comment on how daddy's face lit up when you walked into a room. And even though he'd lost the ability to speak with words, he'd hold your cheeks and he'd tell you how beautiful you looked. When you shaved him and brushed his hair, he'd hold your hands and he'd always say thank you. He was so blessed by you as you were with him. It was a beautiful love story and one we got to witness every day. Such a gift for my brothers and I to see the love that created us last till death do them part. Some of you may say, how could this have happened to such a good man? I want you to know something. My father told us four years ago, just before he went into surgery, that he was ready. He told us he was ready to meet God if that was what was ordained. But we were given four more years, not because he wasn't ready, but because we weren't. God gave us a chance to love him a little longer, to take care of him, to let him know how precious he was. As his physical body became weakened and less, his faith and spirit grew stronger. Many times when we felt discouraged and weary, God showed up. A message, a gift, a visit that restored the drive to go on. On behalf of my family, and especially on behalf of my mother, I'd like to thank those of you who continuously encouraged us and daddy these past years. Auntie Lorna, there are no words that can thank you enough for all you did for daddy and for our family. You gave up your home. It only needed to be whispered that Ken needed something. And by that afternoon, you had searched high and low and by evening it was there. You sat with him and you learned his new language. And many times when there was confusion about what he wanted to say, you almost always knew. And he would shout with glee, yes! We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for ensuring that daddy's last years were filled with the comfort and dignity he'd so fiercely fought for for others. To daddy's nurses and caregivers and doctors, we thank you for your gentle care. Nurse Shireen, Cheryl, Dr. Skyers, you rallied in those last weeks, creating a calm, loving, and spiritually rich environment for daddy to make his transition. Our family remains eternally grateful for the support that extended to us too. Today we say farewell to daddy till we meet again. Daddy, we know without a doubt where you are. You're probably making a wicked peeking duck, learning so much from the great healer himself. And if Peter is missing the keys to the pearly gates, we know who has them. 
Rest well, sweet daddy. I would say you're the best man I know. But in respect for your humility, I'll just say you did your best, and your best was very near perfect. I would just like to express my gratitude to God for giving the opportunity, the blessing, to my mother, to the three of us children, to our spouses and our children, to have shared the life of this great man, our father. To us, he was the great comedian, the great magician, prankster, the great singer, teacher, and a great friend who, no matter what our stage or age in life was, always had words of comfort and sage advice that always lit the path through our most difficult times. I'd like to add my perspective as the youngest Growing up, I saw my dad as a kind of superhero. Whenever there was a serious car accident, he would jump out of the car and run ahead to go and save lives. All that was needed was a theme music in the background. In fact, throughout his life, he was often depending on to fix dire situations, whether it be medical, emotional, political, or national. He always seemed to have the right answer. Of all the glowing descriptive terms I've heard about dad, the most common does not have to do with his skill, but his heart. It is that he was a good man. He was also a spiritual man. Daddy wanted to spend his retirement years preaching the word of God, but he lost his ability to speak before he could retire. St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. When Daddy could no longer use words, his good deeds continued to show to all around him. Although I never got to hear him preach a full sermon publicly, he is one of the best preachers I've ever seen. His message was heard loud and clear by his actions and by his life, and is still heard today. It was my dad's nature to share everything good with everyone around him. So he would want you to know about, not about his goodness, but about his faith. He knew that while his goodness was pleasing in, in God's sight, it was not enough to atone for his own shortcomings and his own sin. For, as the scripture says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. My dad put his confidence in God's grace and depended on Jesus for his salvation. People of that generation sometimes ask if none of his grandchildren or children have followed in his footsteps, meaning none have become a doctor or a politician. But those things were secondary to who dad was. He was first of all good. And I hope that as a family, as individuals, we will follow in those footsteps to be good to our neighbors, to be kind to everyone, and to love God. I'm confident that because of my dad's goodness and kindness to his fellow man, and especially because of his faith in Jesus, that daddy will have a rewarding resurrection. Until then, may his soul rest in peace. Thank you.
May I invite those of us who are so able to stand, please. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The steadfast, the love of the Lord never ceases. His compassion never fails. Every morning they are renewed. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who he did his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. 
be seated for prayer. Let us pray. Lord of life and conqueror of death, you are our help in every time of trouble. In the presence of death, you comfort those who mourn. We bow before you, believing that you bear our grief, that you share in our sense of loss. Give us grace to worship you and to trust in your goodness and mercy. Assure us that because Christ lives, we shall live also. Loving God in our pain, we remember with sorrow how we have failed one another and grieved your heart. In your kindness, forgive our past sins, set us free from guilt, make us strong to live our lives in love. God of grace and God of power, send your Holy Spirit among us that we may hear your promises and know them to be true and so receive the comfort and the peace that they bring through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This sacred aria, Dr. Ball listened to for the last three and a half years of his life every night.
a reading from the book of Ecclesiastics, chapter 12, verses 1 to 7 and 13. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return with the rain. In the day when the guards of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the women who grind cease working because they are few and those who look through the windows see dimly. When the doors on the street are shut and the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. When one is afraid of heights and terrors are in the road, the almond tree blossoms. The grasshopper drags itself along and desires fail. Because all must go to their eternal home and the mourners will go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped and the golden bowl is broken and the pitcher is broken at the fountain and the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the breath returns to God who gave it. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandment, for that is the whole duty of everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Good afternoon, everyone.
The second lesson is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 50 to verse 57. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, 
Where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. A reading of the prayer of Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. This reading is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verse 15 to 19, from the New Revised Standard Version. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go where you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten your belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, send your Holy Spirit among us in this our further act of worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A text of scripture from our gospel reading, John chapter 21 and verse 18. Very truly I tell you, said Jesus, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go where you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Today, a grateful nation joined with Vilma Melanie, Warren, Gregory, and the rest of Ken's family 
in giving God thanks for a life that was truly a gift. Ken was blessed with a good and happy life. And with gratitude, we acknowledge his generous spirit and his life of selfless service to humanity. Each of us is created by God as a story waiting to be told. The challenge is in finding an appropriate way to tell our story that will affirm our identity and give us a sense of hope. People without a place to tell their story and someone to listen to it never come into possession of themselves. Perhaps that's why we are so challenged as a nation in helping others to find themselves. I imagine that what inspired Ken's illustrious service to others and what eventually led him into representational politics was his need to help others tell their story. He knew that by telling of our story and by helping others to do that, ultimately people would come to recognize and own themselves. Regrettably, we have reached a place in our society today where we imagine that all politicians are corrupt, and so we refer to them as a gang of Gordon House, as if nothing good will ever come from the people who sit there. From time to time, we encounter someone, however, like Ken Baugh, who embodied in his public life the godly images of integrity, honesty, and trust. When we can identify those qualities in someone, we cannot help but celebrate, because that is the best of who we are as a people. Ken was no victim. His illness did place limitations on his physical freedom and on his ability to verbalize his thoughts, and yet he lived out the richness of his own history right up to the last. His life was shot through and through with meaning, and because it did, he ignited others with that same sense of meaning and joy. As a physician and politician, he always found ways to ameliorate tough situations. And he did it with such ease and with little noise since he had no need of promoting himself. A rare quality, we may say, for politicians. He's the kind of person Jesus described in the Gospels when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you are poor in spirit, you have no need promoting yourself about how much good you have done. Jesus is not saying that those who live according to the Beatitudes are sure to go to heaven. He said no such thing. What he's saying is that they are a kind of gift for nations and for communities and families. Life itself is a gift, but some of us do more with that gift than others. Some of us regrettably squander that gift to the extent that it is no longer good for anything but to be thrown into a fire heap. But it is a wonderful thing, isn't it, when that gift is used in such a way that it adds favor to life. We are always old enough to die. The young may find that hard to believe, but when you reach 70, the lifespan allotted to us by the Bible, it becomes increasingly obvious. Perhaps that is why the text quoted from John's Gospel has such meaning. When you are young and you think of a future filled with unknown promises, it's quite easy to believe in your own capacity to change the world. It is a different matter when you realize that almost without noticing it, you have become old and that soon the incessant movement of life will carry you away 
as it has carried away every generation before us. So adapting to the time when we are no longer in control and learning to accept the inevitability of death are the final spiritual challenges that confront us. We have heard from Melanie how well can conquer that challenge. And some of us knew that from personal experience. So in our text quoted above, Jesus speaks words to Simon Peter to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. I read that passage that was read for our gospel a number of times for Ken, beginning on one of my first visits over a year ago. He was more than ready to hear those words. Although his departure brings much pain to the family, especially to Vilma, who faithfully cared for him, we can all take comfort that Ken had a good death. But the words are significant for another reason. Not only for one who faces death, but for everyone who wants to live a mature and meaningful life. And so our text highlights the great paradox that ultimately life finds its fulfillment only by letting go. The great paradox is that it is in letting go that we receive life. Jesus said very much the same thing. Those who try to avoid risks, who try to guarantee that their hearts will never be broken, who are afraid of love because love makes us too vulnerable, end up losing life. In so many ways, the more we insist on control and the more we resist the call to hold our lives lightly, the more we have to deny the reality of our losses and the more artificial our existence becomes. Immediately after Peter has been commissioned to be a leader of his sheep, Jesus confronts him with the hard truth that to be a true leader, you must first be prepared to let go and be led to unknown, undesirable, and sometimes painful places. The way of the Christian leader is not the way of upward mobility in which our world has invested so much, but the way of downward mobility ending on the cross. This might sound a bit morbid, doesn't it? But for those persons like Kenneth, who have heard the voice of the one who calls us his beloved, and said yes to that voice. The way of service is a way of joy and peace that is not of this world's making. Much has been said about the character of Ken's leadership in politics as well as his vocation as a gifted surgeon. As we give thanks for this rich legacy, might we not use the opportunity to reflect on the qualities that undergirded the kind of leadership he exemplified. Our text suggests that the kind of leadership we need today is not one characterized by power and control, but a leadership of powerlessness and humility in which the suffering servant of God is made manifest. Obviously, I'm not speaking about a psychologically weak leadership in which the leader is simply the passive victim of the manipulative games of others. No, I'm speaking here of a leadership in which power is constantly abandoned in favor of love and where competitiveness gives way to cooperation and trust. It is a kind of leadership that searches for ways whereby the contribution of everyone is valued. Perhaps what we will remember most about Ken then is this fact, that he never lost sight of his common humanity. He was never a pompous leader, 
No artificial distance existed between him and others. This was true whether he was among his political colleagues or playing with his grandchildren. In his presence, no voice was silenced. Jesus said, the greatest among you must be your servant. For who is the greater? The one at table or the one who serves? The world would say immediately, the one at table. Yet, says Jesus, I am among you as one who serves. Jesus is saying, in effect, I am telling you that the world's way will not work. And it has failed us, as we know. And in the action of washing the disciples' feet, Jesus underlines what, he, what has been true from the beginning and, watch which mu and which must be true to the end. That his way and the way of, the, of those who would be his disciples is before anything else a way of service. The management consultant, Margaret Waitley wrote, and I quote, what gives power its charge, positive or negative, is the quality of relationships. Those who relate through coercion or from disregard for the other person create negative energy. Those who are open to others and who see others in their fullness create positive energy. Love in organizations, then, is the most potent source of power we have available. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. This is the paradox of servant leadership. We grow up with the idea that the greatest people are those who have the most servants. But Jesus is saying precisely the opposite. As he said in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 5, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. The Greek word is diakonos, from which we get the word deacon, one who serves. I am among you as one who serves, said Jesus. Greater is the one who serves a hundred than the one who has a hundred servants. So why then is the temptation of power so irresistible for leaders? Maybe because power often an easy sub substitute for the hard task of love and service. It will always seem easier to control people than to love them. Easier to own life than to love life. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And what does Peter do? Peter asked, can we sit at your right hand at your kingdom? People like Ken Bauer, who resisted the temptation to replace love with power to the end, give us hope and remain true saints. So herein lies the second thing our text points to. If Peter's leadership is to be effective, not only will he have to let go of any pretense of power and control, he must be willing to search out and stretch out his hand to be led by another. Tolstoy, in his confessions, tells how he could find no official purpose for his existence. He was successful, happily married, rich, yet in all this, it seems pointless. He came to the conclusion that man only lived because he believed in something beyond himself. St. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, puts it another way, when he wrote, and I quote, if for this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. End of quote. And now, as Ken discovered, everything is possible. Yes, everything is possible because in Christ, 
We are invited to think and to hope beyond this life. We are invited to think and hope beyond fixed parameters, beyond the doubts scattered in our pathways. We are invited to imagine a different world with new possibilities of living out our humanity. And yet, despite this possibility, we repeatedly hear the argument that human beings cannot change. You can't turn back the tide, they say, go with the flow. This is sadly the narrative we have bought into and accepted. And so we resign ourselves in accepting these things to be true because regrettably we have focused our attention on personalities and institutions that reinforce rather than change human behavior. Not so for Ken, who believe that whatever we are, we might be different. We belong, he belonged to that generation of Jamaicans that believed in themselves and their ability to make a difference for the greater national good. And one of the tragic features of life in Jamaica today is that so many have become cynical in not believing and therefore not prepared to fight to preserve values that will ultimately enrich our collective lives. This is not a risk Ken took and neither must we. He belonged to that generation of Jamaicans, yes, that believed that he could make a difference. And because he believed that, he had eyes to see the rich potential latent within everyone. The good news for the Christian is that the risen Christ is the source of new life and hope to those who choose to believe in him. This is not some empty promise that has no practical implication for our lives. It says to you and me that once our source of meaning is located in things that are imperishable and in a future guaranteed by God, new possibilities will open before us every day. This, I believe, was the passion that shaped Ken's life, where life for him was not simply a task, but a mission. Such a spirit comes from a lifetime of commitment and trust. It doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't come easily. There are good days and there are bad, but there's always a thread of faith that ties us to the risen Christ who said, someone else will put a belt around you, your waist, and lead you where you may not wish to go. After years of leading others, Ken finally stretched out his hand to be led by the one who called him my beloved. Today we thank God for his life, for his life of service to family and nation. What gift. May he rest in peace. Amen. The hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. When peace like a river attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lord thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul
seated for prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together in one communion in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and peace. May all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection die to sin and rise to newness of life. And may we, with him, pass through the grave and gate of death to our joyful resurrection. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, that your Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in your loving care, that casting all their sorrows on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Give faith and courage to those who are bereaved, that they may gain strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a holy and certain hope and in joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Console Kenneth's family in their grief. Surround them with your love. Strengthen them with the grace and peace of your presence. Father of all, 
We pray to you for Kenneth and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May he and all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. An offering will now be collected for the Pediatric Cardiac Center at the Bustamante Children's Hospital. We remain seated for all but the last stanza of the hymn. I come to the garden alone.
Let us pray. Living and loving God, from your hand we receive all we need for life and for godliness. Our lives are channels through which your blessings and graces flow. In response to your loving kindness, we return to you a portion of your blessings on our lives for the sake of ministry at a pediatric cardiac center at the Bustamante Children's Hospital. We pray that these gifts will be used to further life and that each of us might consider ourselves harbingers of hope and channels through which your graces will continue to flow even as we celebrate the life of Kenneth Baugh. Bless these gifts and bless our lives, we pray. For we ask all these things in and through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Be seated, please.
I invite you to stand as we greet our brother Ken for the last in this act of commendation and farewell. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant, Ken, with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind. And we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign but life everlasting. Let us commend our brother Ken to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Deliver your servant, Kenneth Lee O'Neill, O Sovereign Lord Christ, from every evil and set him free from every bond, that he may rest with all your sins in the eternal habitation, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit he live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend thee, your servant, Kenneth. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, in the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Kenneth, unto God's most gracious care and protection we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We remain standing for the national anthem. 